audio. Check. Okay. All right. Sorry, I had to do the changeover from the previous lecture to this one. That's a different style. So we're ready to go. Um, no sound. Oh, it's looking like brilliant sound on my end. Or maybe that's just late. It should be going now. Now, excellent. Let's grind it out then. Grind it out. Okay, so we're going to talk about Knapsack today, and then we'll take a look at some shortest path algorithms. Chiefly, we'll look at Dijkstra's single source shortest path algorithm. We'll poke around at a couple more past that, but not really go into them. So we start out with, of course, one of our last XKCDs of the semester. Um, it's a pretty funny one once we understand what's going on with the problem that we're dealing with. The Knapsack problem here is perfectly displayed in this XKCD comic where the person in the restaurant asks the waiter for exactly $15.05 worth of appetizers given the menu and the waiter of course not a computer scientist apparently says um and then <laughs> he says here's some papers you can read these papers on the knapsack problem it could help you out but then the waiter, of course, complains that he doesn't have time for reading papers because all these other tables. And he said, oh, well, we can also use some TSP to make sure that you can get to all of your tables as optimally as possible. So really great humor there. Good stuff. So we'll start with the knapsack problem itself. Defining is uh, we've got a thief robbing a safe and it has these N items in it. Each of the items has some size and has some value. Sometimes that size is written up as weight. It kind of depends on what the problem is written as. Sometimes it's size, sometimes it's weight. So in the case of size, you've got a bag that only holds a particular size. It doesn't matter how much the stuff weighs, but it can't be larger than a particular size. And that's this capacity M. Or if you go the other way, you know, you could say it's got an infinite size as long as what's put in there doesn't weigh more than M. Whatever. It's an idealized problem here but we, what we have is some physical constraint and then some value that's what the key is so you're trying to find the maximum value that this thief can pack into the knapsack that doesn't go over the size of the knapsack or the weight that the knapsack can hold because then you'll have somebody walking down the street with obvious stolen goods easily nabbed and then you're incarcerated so trying to keep this from uh, sending ourselves into the pokey. Here's a quick example. We'll use this one throughout all of the, the looks we have. So we'll take a quick peek at it. It's got a knapsack of size M equals 11, and there's these N equal five different items. And it's these same five items all throughout the demos. There's sizes one, two, five, six, and seven. So all five of them all alone fit inside the bag. Anything that doesn't fit inside the bag, you can always just ignore. So um, it's sort of trivial when you're looking at items. If the item doesn't fit in the bag, you would never take it. Um, so the, the solution doesn't, the, your solutions don't necessarily check for that, but they do have to make sure that it doesn't sort of run themselves out of range. We're going to return the maximum value, what we can stick in the knapsack. So with this example here, if we're just being able to include items, we can look at this and say, well, the best thing I can do is include that three and four item. I see that, that the three item is size five, the, th the four item is size six. It's not important that I sum up to exactly 11, but whatever I have has to be less than or equal to 11 in size. And then the maximum value, of course, is those two put together, 18 and 22. So anything that I find later on as I'm investigating that has a value less than 40, 
is suboptimal. There's some variations that we go through. The, the standard, of course, is known as the zero one knapsack problem, and that's the one we've just looked at. And we end up flagging each one of these items as either a zero or a one in the sense that if we're not putting it in the bag, it's flagged with a zero. If we are putting it in a bag, then we're taking it, that's gonna give it the one. So each one of those things give me a zero one option. That's the standard. Another way to do this is you might have some finite amount of each item. So there may be more than one item of size one, but not an infinite amount. And that's really just an explicit list that kind of looks like the zero one knapsack problem with more items in it. Another way to do it is to have an infinite number of copies of each item. So this is kind of a, sometimes you don't have an infinite number of anything. It's hard to think of an infinite number, but as, as you're making change in a change drawer, you can use this as a knapsack problem as well. But as you're making change, you can say, well, I don't have an infinite amount of quarters, but I've got more than enough quarters to make change for anything under a dollar. So it's effectively infinite there. So you wonder about how do you get an infinite number of things? Another variation is to have fractional items. So if, for instance, you have an item that's too large to fit, imagine being able to cut that thing down. And if you cut it down, then you get proportionally the value that you expected out of it. What this means is if you had, uh, let me get my screens here right. So if you had, um, for instance, an, an item that was of size 10, and you only had space for five left, if you could cut it in half and get half of the value in there, that's what fractional knapsack is about. It doesn't always work, obviously, if you take um, half a painting because you can't fit the rest of the painting in the bag, you probably don't get much for it. I mean, everybody be mad at you for cutting paintings. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you could also use weight instead of size. So we'll look at solving the knapsack problem using the algorithm families we've already discussed this semester. Brute force, of course, we know will get us the right answer. Brute force gets all the answers. It gets bad answers, it gets good answers, and gets the so-so answers. So brute force will always give us the, the optimal solution. We just may do a lot of work getting there. We'll look at greedy. We have a couple of things to find in the greedy algorithms to make sure that the greedy algorithm we have is optimal. We need to have our optimal substructure, and then we have to have our greedy choice property. So we'll look at how that applies here. Divide and conquer we looked at, but this one isn't a good fit for this type of problem. It's hard to imagine saying, how can I find the maximum amount of stuff I can fit in this bag by seeing the maximum amount of stuff I could fit in two smaller bags, right? Um, if I've got a, for instance, this bag of size 11 and I cut that in half, I say, well, I've got these two five and a half or even just five size bags. Most of my, uh, two thirds, uh, two of my items don't even fit. I've got items that are size six and size seven. And so you can't really optimize this one with divide and conquer. So we won't cover divide and conquer because it doesn't work for knapsack problem solving. Dynamic programming does work because we can break this into smaller sub problems, looking at a bag that does fit smaller things. And I can sort of grow those bags up. The distinction between divide and conquer and dynamic programming, because they're similar, the divide and conquer with the independent subproblems doesn't make sense in a way that we can combine it but since we can have overlapping subproblems the dp solution does make sense if i can solve this the best way for a bag of size five and use that to help me get the best way for a bag of size six there's my overlapping subproblem, and so that's how dp is going to work for us backtracking again that's a constraint satisfaction thing and it's pretty easy to solve the constraints on the knapsack problem. Just don't put anything in there. We haven't violated any constraints or put one thing in there. Haven't violated any constraints, but I also haven't been able to optimize. Backtracking doesn't do that. So backtracking again, that's going to get written out. We're not going to do divide and conquer or backtracking, but branch and bound being an optimizer can be used to help us solve the knapsack problem. So those are the things we're going to look at. And then the last thing I want to add about the knapsack problem before we get into it is it's kind of fun to think of this. Uh, it always makes me think of heist movies and how do I get stuff and get out without taking too much time figuring out what to put in the bag and you get nabbed if your big O is too slow. Um, so that's fun, but that's kind of selling the problem itself short. The knapsack problem is like the quintessential optimization problem. What happens when I've got some 
resource limitation and I'm still looking for some value optimization. So the ways that you can think about this happening every single day is when I'm sending trucks out to deliver packages for Amazon, how many packages can I get in a truck? That's an optimization problem. There's a fixed size. We want to get as many packages in there to make a delivery and have the routing such that it makes good sense financially in terms of deliveries. So that's a knapsack problem. Um, another one that's sort of going on right now, you can think of fantasy football or any fantasy sport you're dealing with. Um, the day-to-day -day leagues have something where you've got a salary that you can use and you can hire whatever players you like. There's your resource limitation. How much salary can you spend? Each player has a price that you can buy them for and then you're looking at the points that they're expected to return so that's where their value is and that's one's fun that's fantasy sports but it's no different from any other team even if you've got to, to do something for you know you're writing uh, a game you've got so much in the budget and you have to hire people to do the music you have to hire people to do the graphics you have to hire the programmers you have to hire the writers you've only got so much money and you can only get what you can get and so the knapsack problem is really important in terms of how we do things on a, on a daily basis in terms of optimizing things so let's make sure we understand it as we leave so here's knapsack brute force we get started we know that it's going to find us the best item because it generates all possible solutions so given this initial set of n items we're going to consider all the possible subsets and with those things either being in or out there's two choices for each of the n items so i end up with two to the n possible subsets with everything being either in or out once i've got all of those subsets looked at i'm going to filter them by saying any subset that's bigger than the bag which is that's gone so if the the subset size is is greater than m that's thrown away everything that's remaining is less than or equal to size m that's a feasible set that could possibly be it then i've got to apply my objective function which is figure out which one of those is the largest so it's a pretty straightforward objective function which one's the largest and i can determine my optimal solution by finding the largest feasible solution and saying that's it so that's brute force kind of looks like this with what we have We've got these five items here, so there's two to the fifth, there are 32 different combinations. You can see all 32 of them here in these two tables, or this one table with extension. The rows that are red, those are things that all have a size greater than 11. So those are things that brute force would generate and look at, but we wouldn't use them because they're definitely violating a constraint. The things that are gray and green then are things that actually fit in the bag and the green one of course we know that's our optimal value of 40 there so that's how brute force does it it just generates all of them and then whew. yes backtracking would save time but it doesn't get us optimization backtracking is just trying to keep us from overfilling the bag so you would say um uh, i put three things in there am i over full no okay there's my solution backtracking is done it doesn't allow you to optimize but you can use the the backtracking aspect of branch and bound to really get to that optimal solution so it's not it's just that pure backtracking is not going to cut it here's the brute force in pseudocode style you see we've got this massive loop here and you can only write loops like this in pseudocode it goes for i equals one to two to the nth right it's a great number there right there in code but that's my big loop and you can see that I've got this array of bools that's my zero one array and it's going to be set to a bunch of falses I'm going to go through and try to turn that into whatever trues makes sense and so I'll use that as I generate the next set in the the power set remember that the power set is the the set of all subsets of a set so if I've got all these items the next power generator just says okay here's the next subset so I'll say okay this is a possible set now I need to see how big that is by finding the sizes of all the items that the that particular possible set includes I'll sum up the sizes and say okay this is the size of this particular set and I can also sum up the value of this particular set probably would do that in one pass just to keep that linear thing down if the set size actually fits less than or equal to M 
and the set value is greater than anything I've seen, then of course I'm going to store that as my current best set. So I'll set best set equal to possible set, make a copy, update my maximum value. So that's the thing that I'm trying to beat from then on. And this goes through and gets it done. All right, so that's brute force. In terms of efficiency, we know that looking through all of those two to the n sets is going to take me two to the n time. And as I look at each one of them, I'm going to have to work through all n of the items to determine what their size con contribution is and what their value contribution is. So I can do those bottom two big O of n's in one linear pass of the possible set, but it's still going to cost me O of n either way. So for each one of the two to the n's, I do n more work. So it ends up as really, really inefficient, the big O of n times two to the n. Any reasonable number of items in the slave in the safe, you're going to spend so much time brute forcing this that uh, you end up nabbed. Backtracking um, will give you a right answer, but it doesn't, it doesn't remember that backtracking just says, does this fit? Have we violated any constraints? No. Okay. Then put another item in there. Okay. Eventually we get to the point where like we violated a constraint and then we say, okay, well don't put that in. So we don't really have a maximization there. I mean, remember that backtracking is just trying to see, is there a way that I can put things in here without violating any constraints? And there's tons of ways, right? I can put the first item in there and I've got something in there. It's like, okay, that's good. I've got a solution. Backtracking is perfectly happy with just putting one item. Backtracking is happy with putting no items in there because there's nothing to say that this isn't a promising solution, right? It hasn't violated any constraints, but you still can't say that it's an optimal solution because backtracking doesn't measure optimality. It just says, does this work? I can put two items in there. That's good. Is that a good solution? It's good enough for backtracking, right? So you would have to do the backtracking yourself, which is then turn backtracking into the sort of brute force version of it where you measure all of the backtrackings and then take the best of them. So you can get a little bit of speed up over brute force. Obviously, it's going to keep you from you know, investigating many of those red ones from the previous graph, but not all of them. Some of them still have to be checked to find out that you violated a constraint. So, because in reality, we know that the backtracking is just brute force with constraint pruning. So, um, that was knapsack though, in terms of brute force, it's pretty easy to figure that one out. Let's step up to greedy. Greedy is going to give us a couple of different ways to look at this. We know that as we're looking for something greedy, we've got a couple of things that are going to make sure that we've got an optimal solution. We're looking for an optimal substructure, which is, can I get an optimal solution by taking one choice or one option or one portion and then adding the optimal solution to the remaining sub problem? And so the approaches that we're going to use are, well, what if I take the highest value item and then remove its size or its capacity from the bag and then solve the optimal solution for the smaller bag, right? So if you go highest value items first, we see that we've got some problems there and you can think your way through this one yourself. You say, well, if my highest value items are very large, then it will rule out other things that I can put in the bag later. So then the option might be say, okay, well, let's go with smallest size items first and sort of sort them increasing in size and keep sticking small items in there. And you can say, well, the more items I get in there, the better chance I have of getting an optimal stash, right? And it has its failings as well, because what if all of the small items are cheap? You just end up with a bunch of junk. You got more items, but none of them are worth enough. So that doesn't always work. You can say, well, if I optimize by value density, I can take them and divide value by size for each item. So I get my highest value per, si by, per size, sort by that, and stick in only the most worthwhile items. We still end up with the size problem, even if we're sticking the densest value items in there. If I stick one in there that's so big I can't put anything else in there, I can easily rule things out. So think about our bag of size 11. If my largest, most expensive item is of size 10, I put that in there, I'm pretty much done. If I've got two items that are just a little bit less, 
but size five and I can put them both in the bag, that big item has ruled it out. So uh, to get a little bit more concrete on that, say my, my size 10 item has a value of 100. I throw it in the bag and I can't really get anything more in there. But my two size five items both have values of 60. So if I were to put the two size fives in, in there for 60 each, I'd end up with a total value of 120, which would be more than the 100 from the 10 item. But because I was being greedy and only taking that 10, I wouldn't end up being able to get my optimal um, take in there. <clears throat> so in terms of knowing whether or not this greedy is going to be optimal, it does have the optimal substructure. Like if I've got a good item in there solving the remainder of this would give me the correct answer but it doesn't satisfy the greedy choice property because i can't necessarily pick that item greedily just like i just illustrated there if i were to take and pick something big in the beginning and prevent smaller items that could be you know really good contributions then my greedy is going to fail so I do have an optimal substructure for a greedy approach but I don't have the greedy choice property satisfied in that I can always take that one item that I need and just get it greedily sometimes greedy is going to rule out better solutions down the line so here's my example you see I've added a row to my uh, table as well here so this is my ratio for value density and that's just dividing value by size. So you can see that 28 divided by seven in the far column, that's four, right? So that's the value density. So in this case, I can do all of the things that I need to do. So if I were to sort them by size and then insert them, I could use that top row, working my way from left to right. I'm gonna be sticking the small things in there. If I was gonna sort them by value, that's, they're already sorted by value in the second row, and I could work my way from right to left, inserting the high value targets in before I get to the low value ones. And the ratio, the density works the same way in this particular example. So to be clear, this is just one example. The greedy can find optimal solutions, but it depends on the input data, just like trying to get to the top of a mountain by greedy mountain climbing. If you start in the right place, greedy actually works. And so given a particular example set, greedy could work as well just with this set we'll see that it fails repeatedly so if we go by size and we stick the small things in there first I put the one in there I put the two in there and I put the three in there because that gives me a total size of eight but now I can't put four or five in there because they're both too large so if I add up my total size haul with one two and three I end up with 25 suboptimal not 40 all right how about value then we stick the ex expensive items in there i put the five item in there for 28 now i don't have room for the four item i don't have room for the three item i do have room <clears throat> for both the two and the one items but as i add that up i see that i've got a uh, 28 plus 6 plus 1 i uh, walk with 35 suboptimal not 40. the ratio one ends up putting them in the same order as the value one so you can see that going by ratio I would pick that one with the highest ratio four that would take up seven of my size giving me 28 value leaving me only four size left so I would once again ditch three and four and add one and two and still walk away with um, my in this example my size gets me less than my value and my my density ratio gets me exactly the same but that's just the way that these sizes and values line up different examples will give you different ones but we can see that we've got just direct proof that greedy is not going to be optimal every time for all three of the approaches because here's one example where it fails all three approaches size value and density here's the greedy pseudocode we've got this uh sort that's going on and this is the version that does it by ratios so you see we're passing in the capacity m as an integer a couple of arrays that have our sizes and values so that I can then try to figure out how do I get the best thing right max value I set that in line one equal to zero current size equal to zero and then I build this array of ratios just by dividing values by size if I sort all of those ratios and 
I need to keep them parallel with their values and sizes. That's why sort ratio takes three arrays. It's sorting those values and sizes by their ratio value. That's going to be something that's big O of n log n, not a big deal. And then you can see that in linear time, once I've got them sorted, that's what's great about greedy. Once you've got things sorted, you just look at each one of the items. You say, well, this either fits or it doesn't. And by the time I get to the end of the items, I'm done. So as I go through that sorted by ratio thing, if the size is such that it fits in the current size of the bag, then I add the value and remove that much from the current size. I'm going to keep going. By the time I get done, Maxwell has my answer in it, it spits it back out. So this one is pretty easy to optimize for any of, uh, or not optimize, but pretty easy to write for any of the greedy approaches, right? Here I've sorted by ratio, but if you want to sort by price or sort by size, you just change that sort, and this is going to work for you greedy-wise. The efficiency, of course, dominated by the sort. N log N. After that, we've got a linear pass that tells us which gets stuck in there, and that's good enough. Big O of N log N plus big O of N. Total big O of N log N. Before we leave, though, I want to point out that Greedy can work for us. If I look at the fractional knapsack variant, this is the one, remember, where I can take an item and cut some of it off and still get the, the full relational value out of it. So if I can only get 20% of an object, I can get 20% of its value just by cutting it. So this obviously is not going to work for you. Um, when it's an Amazon truck and there's not enough room for all of your box, just half of it, you don't expect them to cut that in half. So fractional knapsack doesn't apply everywhere, but it is optimal. When I go greedy, it works because this eliminates the failings of the greedy choice property. If uh, I go by value density and take the most expensive item that keeps it in the densest or the smallest amount of space and then I take the next item and then I take the next item and keep taking them down that right I'm going to get the most capacity or the most value that I can put in there and then when I run out of space at the very end I'm just gonna chop off enough of the most expensive remaining item and I will fill that up so greedy will work with a fractional knapsack it is optimal So that's knapsack from the greedy approach. Up next, DP. Settle in here. This one's going to take a little bit, but we'll get after it. In DP, we've already looked at enumeration. These are things like Fibonacci, binomial coefficient, and night moves. Those were things where I was just trying to count the number of ways to do something or sum up some value. Like Fibonacci is a constraint satisfaction problem. As long as you're looking at a number that is a sum of the previous two numbers and each one of those is a sum of those previous two numbers you haven't violated any constraint you solved it with DP but it isn't an optimization it's just an enumeration can I get to that Fibonacci number the same thing with a binomial coefficient if it's 8 choose 6 as long as I choose 6 of them that's right so those DPs that we looked at in the DP lecture were enumerations. Even night moves, we said, we know this is going to be six moves. Tell us how many different ways I can get there. There's no maximization, no minimization. We're just limited to six moves. And so that's what we've looked at. Those were constraint satisfaction problems. Now we're going to do optimization with DP. And we're going to start with knapsack. Well, we're only going to do knapsack. It's knapsack day. But if you want to get into some more DP problems that do optimization, go look up the longest increasing subsequence. It's a good, it's a great DP style program, or DP style problem to understand and be able to use. Or the weighted independent subset. Those are two of the really, really good DP problems to understand and be able to modify and use for any DPs that might come your way. I hope they're not on the exam. But there's stuff you should know. As I look at these enumerations and optimizations, they both can be so solved top down or bottom up. But a lot of times our optimizations are going to fa favor the bottom up route because we can, we can really build that smaller version and then say, well, if we can use that smaller version to make a slightly larger solution that's optimal, then we can use that to make a slightly larger solution that's optimal. That really sort of lends itself to bottom uppingness. Let's get this for loop that goes from zero up to whatever it is in this case m all right so 
here's the DP knapsack approach. Going back to stealing things and our thief, we've got now a master thief that's gonna prepare this job for an apprentice. And this means, of course, giving the apprentice the alarm code, safe combination, the guard routes, and all that stuff. Oh, oh, and a knapsack, right? Here's the bag. Make sure you come back with the stuff. And what's in the safe is here on this piece of paper. So we've got a list of items in the safe. And, you know, this is a master thief. They really, really prepare for these heists. In addition, here's a table of the items that I want you to put in the knapsack. Not just the list. It's a full-on table. Right, because this table is prepared in such a way that it shows you, here's your bag of size M. And the way that I got to this, because I don't know, the master thief was a computer scientist at one point. So if you're thinking this is a memo, you're correct. So this has the way to solve the best way to put things in there of size M, but it also has the best way to get things in there if the bag was size M minus one and size M minus two and M minus three, all the way down to zero, which of course we can't put anything in a zero size bag. So this is what the apprentice thief takes with them to the job, gets there, opens the safe, and now there's one more item that's not on the list. So the question is, take this new item or leave it. And so if you say, well, I, I know exactly what should go in this bag of size 11, but here's a new item. So if it doesn't fit, then obviously I've got to leave it. Or don't I? Well, if I can take some stuff out of the bag and put this new item in there, then I should say, well, if I remove the right stuff and this fits and it gives me more than I was supposed to bring back from before, then I've got something. And so that's what the DP knapsack approach does is it just takes and adds items one at a time and says, well, if I can find room for this item, I'll do that by removing some stuff if I have to. If it fits, I'll just do it. But if it doesn't fit, then we've got to find a way to make it fit. And if we can find a way to make it fit, then we can say, well, we found a way to make it fit, but it isn't worth more, then it's out. But if we find a way to make it fit and it is worth more, then we keep it. So our DP generalization then is each item is either going to be taken or left behind. We knew that already because that was knapsack. It's a zero one. If it's too large, if it doesn't fit, then obviously it gets left behind. That makes sense from the bigger standpoint. We say, well, this is my total bag. It's size 11. Anything that's bigger than 11 doesn't fit. But while I'm looking at the, the substructure in this DP problem, I'm saying, well, what if I'm maximizing a smaller bag to use that to maximize a larger bag and larger bag all the way up to the size 11 bag? So now I can say, well, if I'm looking at a bag of size five, this item of size six just doesn't go in there. I know that the item of size seven just doesn't go in there. So it's going to be left behind in terms of that optimization. If we can make room to include it, then we will do that when it improves the haul. So if I've got this bag of size 10 and I've said, well, this is the optimal size for a bag of size 10. Should I include this item of size 11? How do I figure that out? Well, I don't do it from the bag of size 10. I say, well, if I've got the optimal bag of size three and I add the value of this item size seven, that would be an optimal 10 bag if I did things right. And so if I've got a better score for 10 than putting this seven item with a three bag, then I go with the older score of 10. But if the seven item with the three bag is better than any other 10 that I've seen, that's what I'm going to take. And then that becomes my new best 10 bag. All right. We'll look at this bottom up. Of course, it's an optimization, so it's easier that way. We'll look at items one at a time. First, we'll say, well, what's the best I can do with just this one item? And then I'll add the next item and then the next add item. But every time I add an item, I'm going to also sort of make my bag span the sizes here. They go from an, a zero size bag all the way up to my target size, my size M bag. So that's my two nested loops. The, the outer loop looks at more and more items and the inner loop looks at a larger and larger bag from zero all the way up to M. This is gonna be a 2D memo. We're gonna build and use that for solving this problem. Here's the code for it. Whoa, let's take it all in. I've got my memo there all important for our DP problems. You have to have the right size memo. When it comes to exam time, 
you get the right size memo, there's points, even if you don't use it well or at all. You're still going to get points for declaring the right size memo. Get that, get it done. What do I have here? I've got this memo of size N plus one, M plus one. And this is because I'm programming in two directions here. I'm programming in the N direction. Let's start with just one item. Then let's go to two items. Let's go to three items. Let's go to four items. That's me programming in the end direction. And as I look at each new set of items, right, I've got just one item. And then I'll look at all of my bag sizes, zero to one to two to three to four to five, all the way up to M. Then I'll add two items and I'll go zero to one to two to three to four to five up to M. So each time I add more items to my set, I'm going to go from zero up to M. So I have to have both of those programming directions in terms of dynamic programming. So I've got M plus one on both of them to make my memo happen. All right, that's the basics. What else is basic about this problem? I know in the end that my answer is gonna be at N comma M. That's why I made it big enough to do that. So even before I get the body, six to 14, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But 15 is fundamental. Even if I can't figure out what's going for me on the exam, six to 14, make sure you get 15 in there. Make sure you get three, four, and 15 in there. As soon as you start, you know what the memo is, you know how big it needs to be, and you know where the answer comes from in the memo. Sometimes it's something straightforward as, okay, it's gonna be in the NM location. Other problems you might say, okay, well, I've done this sort of a row at a time, so somewhere in the last row is my best value. So I've gotta pick the smallest item in the last row or the largest item in the last row or what it is. Whatever it is, you've got to figure out how to get that answer out of there. And it seems kind of cheesy. It's not me trying to get you to game the exam. It's actually fundamental to understanding how to solve this. If, if you can't get the right size memo and you can't figure out where in the memo the answer is going to be, you're never going to get there anyway. So do start with getting your properly sized memo because that's going to make sure that you understand which directions am I programming in. So when I was doing night moves, I had my board that was eight by eight by m plus one because i wasn't programming in the eight by eight direction the board is already fixed in size but i had these six moves and so i had to go seven in my memo there that's getting an understanding of what the problem has for you so get the memo size right then figure out where in the memo the answer is coming from and put that on there and we'll work on what's going on in the middle there right there's two things that are going to go on in the middle then we need to make sure that we understand the substructure I need to understand that um, my solution is some combination of either the best of a smaller version or, uh, sorry, either, so you see here um, in lines 11 and 12, I say what I'm gonna put in this new location, because I'm always trying to fill out some new portion of the memo. What I'm putting in this new location is either something that previously existed in the memo right, the row just above this same column, or the row above some columns over plus a new value, whichever one of those is largest. So what I wanna see for you to get some points, again, is the fact that you've identified that memo IJ is an important place to look, and that memo IJ minus items dot size plus items I value is an important thing. Those two things are fundamentally important. If you get them on there just somehow, even if you haven't used them well, that's points because you have identified the optimal substructure that this problem has. Then the next thing that's gonna be the remainder of the points is, do you combine the sub problems well? In this case, it's a maximization, so I've gotta max those two and put the maximum value in another one. Another one might be a minimization. Another one might be not an optimization. It could be an enumeration. You say, well, I have to have these three locations. And the way that I move forward is to sum those three locations, right? You have to figure out how to combine the sub problems and you have to figure out what the sub problems are. You have to get a good memo and you have to return the right thing out of the memo. So that's all it is. Sometimes it's not so easy to see, but if you sort of approach it in the ways that I'm talking about here, just start getting stuff on the paper. Sometimes it's easier to get stuff on the paper than it is to even understand the problem. And then as you start looking at it, you say, okay, well, if I've got these two values, what makes sense? Well, it's a maximization. I might as well at least use max. Boom. You've got max on there. That's literally, that's points just having max in there because this one's a maximization problem. You've put it on things that you should. That's another set of points there. You've designed the things that should be used, more points. So 
Um, you can see that this is a double loop thing. It's got a for loop with a for loop. My outer loop is N, my, my inner loop is M. So it's a big O of N, M times N. So you know that you're keeping yourself inside of some complexity, which will be given to you on the exam. So that's what's going on here. You can see that as I run through each one of these N items in my outer loop six, for each one of them, I'm gonna take my size and go from zero all the way up to M. In this case, M plus one, because I wanna be able to write in that location. You say, well, if I've got this N plus one sized vector, how come my outer loop only goes up to N? It doesn't use all of them, does it? It does, because we're gonna leave the first row completely empty. What's that? It's an empty row, well, it's, a, it's a bunch of zeros. Right, because that's the row where I'm, I'm saying, well, how many items are you including? Zero. Well, no matter what my bag size is, if I've got zero items to put in there, the value is just zero. Seems like kind of a waste. I've got a whole row of zeros in there that just stay as zeros. But what that does is it allows my memo to hold everything I need. Because remember, the memo is just gonna be saying, I can build this row by looking at something in the previous row. So even as I'm trying to get the first item, I need a zero item row for the one item row to be able to refer backwards to. In that case, it's trivial, but it makes it so that you don't have to write a special case for this first row because it, it doesn't have anything that it's based on. All right. So this is my N by M or N plus one by M plus one memo. And you can see that my outer loop fills it by leaving it all full of zeros in the first row but then the next n rows it runs through these zero to uh m plus one values so that i can fill this thing out and if something doesn't fit it doesn't go in the bag that's what the if in eight and nine do right so j is the current size of the bag that i'm optimizing so that goes up to m so i can say if the size of the bag that i'm currently optimizing is smaller than the item I'm trying to stick in there, it doesn't get included. So when I fill in memo I plus one J, that's saying like, let's just look at this without the I item. Let's not include the I item. So that's saying like, for instance, if I've got three items and I've got a best bag of size six, as I add to the fourth item, if the fourth item doesn't fit, then my best bag with four items and size six is just the best bag with three items and size six, right? That's what that is. Memo I plus one J is equal to memo I J. Just look up in the previous row and take that value. Else it fits. Now we're going to look up still, but if we can beat that by grabbing something from off to the side and bringing it in there, we will. So that's where the max comes in. A little bit hard to see here in code, but let's look at it in an example. There's the stuff we're looking for. We know our answer in the end. 18 plus 22, 40, items three and four, got it. Well, let's go at it here. This first row I said, it's all zeros, right? That outer loop is gonna be all zeros and now it makes good sense, right? You can see with zero items, doesn't matter how big the bag is, you're getting zero out of it. All right, how about the next one? Well, I've got a zero size bag, even though now I have one item, but that still has to be a value zero because I can't put anything in a bag that doesn't hold anything. But when I get to this first location here, this one, one, I can say, well, now I've got a bag of size one. I got an item of size one. It fits. So let's put it in there. How much value does it bring? Well, if I look up there in the table, it says it's got a value of one. So that's what the, the table here is, has a bunch of values in it. If my bag gets to be size two, well, I can only put that one item in there once. And so all the way up to infinity, when I'm looking at just the one item, the best I can do is one. I put that item in there, I get a value of one, and I walk. All right, let's look at the two item. The two item has a size two, which is great. It doesn't fit in a zero bag. The two item doesn't fit in a one bag. But how about this? The two item does fit in a two bag. But how do I know to use it, right? So far, uh, let me back up one, right? Where did this one come from? This one came from the row above this because I said the two item doesn't fit in a one bag so all I did is just, just copied the one from the the one row straight down it didn't fit I just copied down when it does fit I'm gonna max straight up and over some right so that six actually represents the max of the one in the row directly above this 
or if I move up one row and over two, because remember I'm putting an, 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 an item of size two in there. So I've got to go up one and over two and add that six to that value. So if I go from this six location up one and over two, you see that it's at uh, item one size zero. So it's got a value of zero. If I take that value of zero and add six to it, I say, which is bigger? That's zero plus six or the one directly above me. You say, well, it's clearly it's the zero plus six. So that's where the, the plus six comes in there. All right, what happens in the next location? That one makes sense, doesn't it? Now I've got a bag of size three and I can clearly put in the two item and the one item because that's a total of three. But where does it come from, right? It says, let's take the max of the one directly above or adding that two item to the best one bag with one item. So we see that that first one that I wrote in the, in the, in the table at the one row, one column, if I add six to that, that's where the seven comes from. And since that seven is larger than the one directly above us, row one, column three, we take the seven. It gets simple after that because once again, it doesn't matter how much bigger the bag gets. If I've already put all of the items that I have in the bag, I never get any more value. So those would all be sevens as well. But you see how I can sort of keep doing this application. If I wanted to, I could pick this up in the middle and say, how did I get that seven in row two, column eight? Well, I added six from the two to row one, column six, because it was two away, two size away, and one row up. I added six that I get seven, it works. That's what happens. Next row. Now we're talking the three item. The three item is size five. So anything under size five is just a direct copy of the row above it because this three item doesn't even fit. So I'll take the best bag that I had without it at that size. Now, as I get to this three item, well, including all three items at size five, now my question is, should I take the seven above or what do I add? I add the 18 and I'm going to jump back five columns, five columns, one row up. That's the zero, the first zero in the row two. If I add 18 to that, I've got 18. I could take 18 or I could take seven. What are you taking? I'm taking 18. That sounds better, right? So we keep adding these things on here. Of course, I could add one more item in there. Once I've got the five item plus the one, that makes good sense because I'm adding now what? I'm adding 18 instead of to zero, I'm adding 18 to one from row to column one, right? So that 19 is an improvement over seven, I take it. What happens when I move on, right? Now I'm adding how did I get the 24? I got the 24 by adding this size five item to the best two bag. So the best two bag held six for me in the previous row. And I add the 18 from this size five item, 18 and six, 24, improvement over seven, we take it. I keep going, it's 25. This is better because I'm adding the 18 to a seven now. And you can see that I keep adding 18s to 7s for the rest of infinity on after that. Because now, once I've got to 25, I've included all three of the first items. It doesn't matter how big my bag gets. It's just going to be 25. All right, next up. Item of size 6. Copy, 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 copy. Doesn't even fit yet. So those first things are just brought down. But now when I've got to the 6, what's better? The 22 that the 6 brings or keeping the 22 or, or the keeping the 19 from the six bag without the four item and there it is so the 22 is the improvement i can see there's a 24 right now in this case i didn't add the one item because remember previously that's what's happened for me and worked pretty well once i've got some big item in there and i just go one larger i can usually add the one item and it's an improvement but here adding the one item which is one size and one value gives me a 23 value in seven size, but I've got a better way to get to seven, which is the two and five items, or the size two items, the size five item. That gives me a seven that gives me 24. So here I've copied from the row above as opposed to making the 
the the max is giving me the the one directly above as opposed to, to bringing in the sum all right 28 you can see where that comes from 29 once i get to 29 i'm just about done but look at there's the 40 that we know we're looking for let's see where that came from that 40 was i could take 25 which is row 3 column 11 or i could include this four item which has size six so if i jump back six columns in that three row i get the five you see that five three is an 18 18 plus 22 is a 40 that's greater than 25 i'm taking the 40 there's my optimal solution as i add this last item nothing fits yet so that's all just direct copies now the seven item makes an improvement there it makes some improvements there more improvements but it doesn't add anything there at the end you see that adding the seven item doesn't make an improvement that fits right so if i put that seven item in in this 11 bag it has to be with the best four bag from the row before and the best four bag from the row before only brought seven value so seven value plus 28 value is 35 not better than the 40 so i'm just going to copy straight down to get that 40. um so the question here how much worse does the solution to this problem get if you have to store the items you choose oh that's the reconstruction right how do i get <clears throat> six again which six at row two call two okay so at row two call two um you can see that i'm in trying to decide whether to include the two item and the two item takes up two space so if i'm going to include the two space item in a two bag then i'm going to take the score from a zero bag because that's the only thing that's going to fit i can put a zero bag and a two item in a two bag so that's the sum, and if that zero item score, I mean, it just happens to be zero. It works all across the board there. That's the first place it works, though, is I take this zero bag, I add the two item, that gives me a six, and so my choice is I can either take this newly added zero bag plus a six, or the old version, which was just the one size item, in a two bag. So the max of zero plus six and one from directly above so it's up one over two because it goes over two because of the size two up one over two which is one fewer item at that smaller size that plus this new item is that better than just straight up if it is then i'm going to take that whichever one of those is best so you can see various locations in this memo where we copied from straight up and other places where we decided well straight up isn't better than adding something so we'll add all right there it is just for animation's sake it blew up 40 that's going to be my return value because i'm going to say the best i can do is going to be in this i've considered every item and considered every size square brackets that thing there's my answer All right, that last question was how, how much worse does this get to see if I now I need to figure out what the items are. That's a reconstruction. And you know, it goes back to our original assumption. Included items either improve a smaller solution or they don't. So if they don't improve a smaller solution, they get excluded. So if a smaller solution plus an item is greater than or equal to the full solution, without the item it's included. That's saying like, if this size seven item plus the best four bag gives me a better 11 solution than I've ever seen, then the size seven item is included. But if the size seven item plus the best four bag isn't an improvement, the size seven item gets junked. We just leave it behind. And we can look at our completed memo and figure out what items get taken just going from that NM location, working my way backwards. I'm gonna backtrace my way to get up to either zero in M or zero in N. Really, when I get to either one of my zeros, I've gotten back to, I'm figured it out. So um, here's what the reconstruction algorithm looks like. And you can see that uh, without even understanding what's going on, we're passing in the items, we're passing in the memo from the completed DP 
uh, value calculation. And I'm also passing in the size of the bag so I can figure out how to make this thing work. Uh, what else goes on there? Some constant time declarations and blah, blah, blah. But I've got one for loop. Everything else is pretty mundane. It's just ifs or pluses or comparisons or assignments. So it's all a bunch of constant work, but there's one for loop in there. And we see that that loop goes from N down to zero. So the runtime of this is faster than it took, it's faster to find the answer than it took for me to generate the table. The table was a big O of MN, and now reconstruction of the actual set of items to take is big O of N. So it, it's, it's almost unnoticed, right? So what do we do here? We'll come back and look at the code. Let's just watch it in action. So I'm gonna start in this lower right-hand corner. And so I can say, if the five item was created, remember, that means it was an improvement on the solution from something in the four row. So if I look at that five item, I see that it's got a size of seven, so I can jog back seven columns, and I'm looking at row four, column four, I see that value is seven. And so what I'm saying is, if seven, plus the 28 is greater than or equal to the 40 right above me, then I would have inserted that five item. But seven plus 28 is 35, which is why I didn't include the seven item. So then you can see that my backtrace says, well, we skipped the five item. It didn't make an improvement. So really our best five bag came from our best four bag. So we jog up one. So every time I move up one, that's me ignoring an item. Every time I move across, that's me including an item. So now let's do that same thing. We're trying to figure out whether or not the four item was included. If I jog over six columns to the left, now I'm in row four, column five, and I see that the value there is 18. 18 plus the value from the four item, 22. 18 plus 22 is 40. If that's greater than or equal to the 25, and it is, then I used this item. And you can see that that's where this came from. This 18 came, uh, this 40 came directly from that 18 by adding that item. So I've gone across there then. Let's do the same thing. Now to try to decide whether or not the three item is included, I'm gonna jog over five columns. That puts me at the zero column. So then the question is, is the value from the zero column second row, that's a zero plus 18, is zero plus 18 greater than the seven directly above? And yes, it is. It has to be greater than or equal to. If it's greater than or equal to that, then I say, well, it's included. So yeah, sure enough, I'm there. And once I'm here, though, you can see that I'm done, right? There's, I, I, can, I can either hit the zeros by hitting the top first, or I can hit the zeros by hitting the, the left first. But once I get to zero, then there's nothing else to include. So those things are just based on not having included either the item two or the item one. So you can see I've got this diagonal line in the four to three row, so four is included and in the three to two row, so three is included. So my ultimate solution has items three and four, and that's what this previous page code does. Right, you can see some common things there like in line 25, if the item that I'm looking at is small enough to fit, right? C is my current capacity. If the item that I'm looking at is too big, then obviously it wasn't included in that bag. But if it is small enough to fit, then here I have that same thing. If that value from up one and over some plus this new item, if that's greater than directly above, the item was included. Taken of i is equal to true, and I make the bag slightly smaller by whatever i's size was. So definitely go back, make sure that you understand these two pieces of code. They work really well together. They will solve this in a total solution of big O of MN even with the reconstruction at the end. That is Knapsack DP. All right. Let's check out branch and bound. This one's gonna be pretty quick. We don't have a full example. We're just gonna to try to touch on it because I don't wanna confuse anyone who's still trying to wrap up branch and bound for uh, TSP. And the reason why it's confusing is TSP is a minimization, obviously and knapsack is a maximization. And so everything is completely reversed. And if you think too hard about how knapsack works um, with branch and bound, you just get completely lost. It gives me a headache thinking about it, reversing the things. It makes sense, but not when you're trying to think about the two of them at the same time. So knapsack branch and bound is gonna be something that works. It's an optimization. 
knapsack is an optimization we know that um from our earlier discussion of branch and bound that there may be other ways to do it like we saw here we saw that there is a nice dp way to solve knapsack problem but if i couldn't figure out knapsack with dp i could fall back on a branch and bound solution and it could be used to solve this because branch and bound will solve optimizations knapsack being a maximization we've got to invert everything that we know of branch and bound from tsp so now instead of my initial estimate being an upper bound it's a maximization so now my initial estimate and my current best solution are going to be a lower bound right and that's making sense because you're saying i'm trying to get this best thing and if this is my lower bound that means don't ever consider anything less than this because anything below that is, is not good enough i've already gotten to here so i'm only looking for things that are better than this anything below my lower bound is obvious junk so that's my initial estimate has to be less than or not greater than i should say it should be it could it could be less than or even equal to optimal but if it's greater than optimal, then I'm not going to find my, my optimal with branch and bound. So my initial estimate has to be a lower bound. And as high as I can get that, the better off I am, the faster things go. Then the remainder of branch and bound is you calculate some partial solution. You know I've got these three things in the bag, so I can tell you what their total is. But then I need to estimate what putting the rest of the things in the bag are going to bring me. And that's going to be an upper bound. And I want my estimate to be no shorter than actual. Whereas in TSP, I wanted it to be no longer than actual. Everything is inverted. So if, if I'm going no shorter than actual, what happens? When I get more accurate, my estimate gets smaller. So it's okay to overshoot with my estimate because if I overshoot with my estimate and it still isn't up to the, up to the lower bound, then in reality, if I get more accurate, it's gonna be a little bit smaller, right? So if I overshoot and I'm inaccurate, the reality is a little bit less if if the overshoot is below the upper bound uh, sorry if the overshoot is below the lower bound then i'm gonna prune so that's how knapsack branch and bound works we've got the elements promising it's pretty straightforward the total weight of the items has to be less than m it's hard to violate any constraints here other than that one right we can't have anything over the bag size <clears throat> the solution then is any collection that's promising the lower bound starts with the highest possible underestimate and ends with the maximum value taken. So how do we get a nice high underestimate? Greedy was great for that. We saw Greedy get us some pretty good values and really quickly. Value density was the one that gave us one of our best answers. It wasn't optimal, but in terms of Greedy, it was really quick and it's a great starting point. Remember that I was trying to get to 40 and my Greedy knapsack with by value density gave me a 35. That's a great place to start if you're trying to go from uh, to up to 40. So I can start with my lower bound as greedy and then my upper bound is gonna be the sum of what I've already included plus an overestimate of what can fit in the remaining space. And I prune if my upper bound is less than my lower bound. How do I get that overestimate? Turns out that even though this isn't a fractional problem, I can use greedy fractional knapsack because we know that greedy fractional knapsack will give me an optimal solution for that size. And since it has the ability to add more than I can actually add in the zero one sense, I'm gonna get an estimate that's never gonna be less than my zero one estimate. It could be equal to my zero one estimate, but it could be longer than. So if I use that as my overestimate, that's pretty fast as well. I can use my greedy zero one to get my first lower bound and then as I add new stuff, I'll do a greedy fractional knapsack on the remainder of the space and say, well, if that's not enough, then it's never gonna be enough. We'll prune, all right? And one last thing is I don't need gen perms here. It doesn't matter the order of the way that I put things in the bag. I just need combinations. So I've got a smaller search base. This one is an N factorial, right? I just need to know which one of those things are in or out. So. Um, as you look at them, you don't have to use gen perms to generate your combinations. You, know, you, you use something that generates combinations. And that's about as far as I'm going to go into knapsack with branch and bound. You can take some time after you're done with P4 and, you know, just give yourself 15, 20 minutes to just sit there and ponder your way through how this one's going. If you want to sit down, throw some code together. It's a fun thing to do, too, uh, especially when you know, we're done. <laughs> so that's knapsack branch and bound. We've got one last topic here.
That's shortest path algorithms. We're not going to go into a whole bunch of them. We are going to go into Dijkstra's algorithm, though. <clears throat> Gear shift here. We've gone from stuffing bags to running graphs. So Dijkstra's algorithm is a graph algorithm. It helps us with shortest path. So here's some examples of shortest path. Obviously, if you think of driving, the first thing that comes to mind is how far you're going. That's one of the shortest paths. Shortening or, or minimizing the distance is pretty uh, fundamental to shortest path. But you could also think of this in terms of how can I do this with the shortest travel time? And you see that in Google Maps. You can take either the shortest physical route or the one that's going to get you there fastest or the one that's going to take um, the, the least amount of time, right? Another way to think of this is uh, something that a shipping company might do. I want to have a path that has the smallest number of stoplights. Whoever wrote these slides was really into Krispy Kremes. I don't know, that's kind of like a shortest path with a maximization because I, I would figure if I'm looking for Krispy Kremes, whatever. You, you see what I'm saying, though. There's different ways that I can approach what does it actually mean for a shortest path. Right? If I'm looking at airport travel, right, it could be my travel time. How long is it taking me to get from point A to point B? It could be the, the total price that I'm trying to sort of maximize, or in this case, optimize, minimize. Maybe I'm trying to get the most amount of frequent flyer miles. I'm trying to minimize or maximize distance here. So as I'm looking at shortest path, sometimes these shortest paths are their optimizations, right? You can be looking at um, a number of different things travel time fares and so on so here's weighted path length we've got some edge weighted graph it could be directed it could be undirected it doesn't matter um, but it does have to be edge weighted if I've got this calculating function this C that measures the weight of an edge from V sub I to V sub J then any path that runs through a sequence of vertices where P is this collection of V1 V2 VZ v3 all the way up to v sub k then i get the weighted path length is just the sum of all the edges really straightforward this is not rocket science the shortest path problem then is given some edge weighted graph and two vertices my start vertex and my destination vertex find the path that starts at v sub s and ends at v sub d and has the smallest weighted path length that's the problem statement and the single source shortest path that we're going to look at is going to do just that. And it does it, though, in a way that might seem at first glance to be a little bit overkill, right? The only way to find it with this single source shortest path is to find the shortest path from V sub S to everywhere, not just from V sub S to V sub D. We have to find the path from V sub S to V sub everywhere. And why is that? <clears throat> you never know. If you say, well, I found the shortest path through these five items, I'm good. I'm not even gonna check those other ones over there. What happens if you find a short path to one of those other items and then it's adjacent to your solution and you can get to your, your destination even faster than something that you've already checked. So you have to get all of them. You're gonna find the shortest path from V sub S to V sub D by finding the shortest path from V sub S to V sub everywhere. So here's an example of a shortest weighted path. We'll see that we're going from B to F. And this goes up to B to A, down A to C, then C to E, and then E to F. So B, A, C, E, F is my shortest weighted path. If I were looking at an unweighted path, you see here that I could just cut across from B to C to E to F. So my shortest weighted path has got a total weight of nine. My shortest unweighted path has a weight of 10, but it's got three edges instead of four. So depending on what you're looking for, the appropriate algorithm is what you should be using. Here's my shortest path problem with an issue though. We can't have negative cost cycles. You see where I've got this negative weight edge. And what happens if I take this cycle here from A to C to D to A to C to D, every time I go around, I'm plusing six and minusing eight. So I can, add a bunch of circles, uh, a bunch of cycles through this path to anything and make it cost whatever I want, right? D, A, C, E, F, I can make that cost me four or I can take another loop, A, C, D, and make it cost me two or I can take two loops and make it cost me nothing. So shortest path problem isn't really well defined when I've got these negative cost cycles in many situations 
that have physical analogs. There's no such thing as, uh, you know, there, there's no such thing as a path from one of these cities to another city that has a negative distance. So the shortest path problem isn't really well defined for graphs with negative cost cycles. Here's Dijkstra's algorithm. It's greedy. It solves the shortest path problem and it does need non-negative weights. Zeros are okay, but nothing negative. And it's going to find the shortest path from V sub S to V sub everywhere. This slide hopefully looks familiar to you. That means you've watched some other lectures. For each vertex V, we need to know K sub V is the shortest path known. D sub V, what's the length of that shortest path? And P sub V, what vertex perceives it? Prim's algorithm, you say? Yes. Very, very, very closely related. Prim's algorithm, Dijkstra's algorithm. Prim's algorithm has been numerously discovered and one of the names for Prim's algorithm is Prim wasn't even the first person who found the algorithm. Um, but one of the names for the Prim's algorithm is actually the Dijkstra Prim algorithm. So um, Dijkstra's algorithm and Prim's very, very similar. So you should get this really quickly if you've already got your MST down from part A of the project. We're going to look at it in the way that we did with Prim's. Now I'm going to do that same path from B to F. So that means I'm going to find the shortest path from B to everywhere. Let's start at B, set the distance from B to zero. That's good. And now just like Prim's, I've got a, an outer loop with three steps inside of it. And there's just one small difference, right? So in this outer loop, the first thing I'm going to do is discover which one of these falses has the shortest D sub V. It's clearly B because that's a zero and the rest are just infinity. So I'm going to take that as my current location. Still looks exactly like a prims at first glance. I've got B, which is adjacent to A and C. And you see that those threes and five, the three and five were better than the infinities that were already there. And I got there through B, so I updated the piece of V. This would be the first step exactly in prims algorithm. And the slight distinction is it's impossible to see on this first pass because it cost me zero to get to B I added that cost to get to B to everything that B led me to so B led me to a in three but the three in that a row isn't the three from B to a it's actually the zero that it took to get to B plus the three it just happens the total three the same thing is true for five i had cost me zero to get to b so the zero to b plus the five to c makes zero plus five it still ends up as c being five but it's an addition there it's not just to take that edge and we'll see that makes the difference here in my next step so now i've done one full outer pass i'm going to do the next outer pass which is go through all of the falses and find the one with the shortest d that's of course a so we'll do step one finds a step two marks a as true and then step three goes and updates everything that a is adjacent to that hasn't already been updated so a is adjacent to b c and d but b is already marked as true so a only worries about trying to update c and d we see we've got the edge to, to c in one and the edge to D and five, but I didn't get to A for free. It cost me three to get to A. So I add three to the one, and that's where I get the four that C has. I add three to five, that's how I get the eight that D has. Both of those are improvements, so I update them and set their parent equal to A. That's the only difference between Prims and Dijkstra's. Instead of just taking the edge, I take the cost it took me to get to the parent and add that to those edges so now that's two passes down two nodes blued up i got four to go what do i do i go through finding my shortest faults again this is c now let's mark c as true noting that c has a sunk cost of four already in it anything that c can reach has to have four added to it four plus two to get to d is six that's an improvement over the eight that i got through a so i'm going to take it through c Four plus four is eight, which is an improvement to E over the infinity. So I'm gonna take that as well. And things just proceed on in their normal sort of Prims-like way, other than the fact that I'm always taking my current point and its distance and adding that to the edges that it touches. 
So when I'm done, this looks like almost like a completed prims table. I've got the edges that are important. They're in my V to P sub V. So I can see that AB is an important edge. I can see that C to A is an important edge. D to C is an important edge. E to C and F to E are all important edges. Everything else is unimportant. I can't add this D sub V column anymore because that doesn't make sense. Because it doesn't represent tree weights, now what it represents is path lengths. So if I say, what is the distance from B to E? I just look in the E row at the D column and the distance from B to E is eight. Well, how did I get there? Well, E came from C, C came from A, A came from B, B is B. So there's my path. And so I've got the ability to find the, the path lengths from B to any one of these things. And I can also backtrace to find out what the edges that are included in the path are. Yeah, that negative weights thing that doesn't work by adding that smallest negative weight thing. It doesn't work. I, I, I could give you a better example with a bit more time. I'm trying to wrap this up under my time. I was way over last time, so I'll get there. Um, we'll definitely talk about it in office hours if you want to know. Dr. P is just phenomenal at coming up with examples on the fly of how these things break. It takes me a little bit longer, but um, just offsetting just doesn't fix it. All right, so now I've just sort of pared down the edges that I don't need and I've turned them into arrows. So this is sort of the back trace. And you can see instead of having edge weights, I've included just the value from D sub V. So that's what I say, you can see that it cost me nine to get to F. And if I wanna know how I got there, F came from E, came from C, came from A, came from B. So B, A, C, E, F is how I got there. Nine is what it cost me. Same thing with D, I can go D to C to A to B, B, A, C, D is the path. Six is what it cost me. So this is what you can get out of doing Dijkstra's. It's exactly everything that Prim's was. It's V squared if I've got a dense graph. I'm gonna go V squared for this simple nested loop thing. All I'm doing is just one more plus sign in there that I wasn't doing before. Um, if I've got a sparse graph, I can use heaps and I can do this in E log V just like Prim's. Nothing new here. Even these slides are pretty similar. So to, to do Dijkstra, I've got to initialize some stuff. I can see that N is going to be just how many items are in V. I can get that in constant time. Creating this table, which is where I initialize my K's all to false, my D's all to infinity, and my P's all to undefined. That's going to cost me how many nodes I have, or, or V. Big O of N is really big O of V, because there's one for every vertex in that table. Empty heap, constant time setting one value to zero constant time and inserting one edge into the priority queue an empty one i can do that in constant time right because it was an empty one and as i add one thing it cost me just constant time to push it in there there's no fixing here is the loop that we had previously we can see that looping through this pq is empty in the worst case every edge goes in there and every edge comes out so this is a big o of e for my outer loop the things that are inside it, I get my min value here off of topping and popping. I get it top for, for constant time, but as I pop it to remove it, I've got to fix the heap, which is in the worst case log E to get that thing removed. My checks here, those are constant time. If that item isn't already known, I can check that in constant time. Then mark it as known, I can do that in constant time. As I go through each one of my items adjacent to the current vertex, that's one plus on average, E over V edges, then I can say in constant time, add my current distance to each one of those edges. And if that edge is better than what was there, update it. That all happens in a bunch of constant time steps. And if I've got one that's better, I am going to do an insertion in the priority queue, which could be in the worst case, E log E deep. So uh, my insert in the PQ gives me some fixes. Log E is there. This whole thing wrapped up by uh, my, my outer loop there is multiplied by an E. So all of these things get multiplied by E. You can see here why I get an, an E log E total complexity. Um, to get the edge set out of this, I've got to run through each vertex and figure out what its parent vertex is. I can do that in V time and finding out what its parent is, I can get that in constant time. So building my actual edge set is then done in V time. So it cost me E log E or 
I would say e log v because remember I'm doing this in a sparse graph when e is on the order of v. So e log v to do the work and an additional v to build that set of answers at the very end. And that is Dijkstra's algorithm. One more for the road. I've got this shortest path problem. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to leave it for you. I will give you the answer, though. We can see the answer here pretty much by, by inspection. We're trying to get from O to T. And you can work your way forward. You can work your way backward. So you can start this as a Dijkstra from O and setting O's D sub V equal to zero and running through the algorithm because that will give me the shortest distance from O to everywhere, which of course includes the shortest path from O to T. Or you should also try it the other way. Well, let's start at T. If I set the distance from T equal to zero and then I work my way through Dijkstra's, it will give me the shortest distance from T everywhere else, which is also the same as the shortest distance from O to T, T to O, because this is an undirected graph. So you can do this and you can see that uh, as we leave out of O, I would rather take the two if I could. That gets me to A and then I can get back to the middle of the graph with B there. So O, A, B, I can get to the middle of the graph pretty cheaply for four. Moving on, I can get to D and four more and then T in a total of 13. So your path to T should be 13. It should go O to A to B to D to T make sure you can dijkstra that the last thing that's included in these slides is what happens when i'm trying to do all pairs shortest path well i could run dijkstra once for every location i could run dijkstra v times i say well it's v squared to do it um if i did that v times it would be v cubed sounds terrible there's got to be a better way <laughs> there isn't there's floyd's algorithm um Floyd's algorithm is also V cubed on a dense graph. And that's a really cool DP solution that's kind of hard to wrap your brain around, but if you're trying to sort of ingest some more DP and you're good at trying to figure out how these graph problems work, check out Floyd's algorithm. And you can do it right here. Here's all of the slides that we used to teach Floyd's algorithm with. I think there's a couple dozen of them, right? Goes through a bunch of things. We're not gonna teach it anymore. It won't be on the exam. So all pairs shortest path is not included. <clears throat> you don't need to know it, but they're perfectly good slides and who gets rid of good slides? If you ever want to check it out, check it out. Um, go watch a video on somebody explaining Floyd Warshall. Like I said, it's an interesting one to wrap your head around as you're trying to get a good grasp on how DP solutions work. All right, that's it. I pulled it off under 130. Any other questions that we haven't resolved through now? Um, let's pull those in office hours or... Uh, uh, we could hop over and check that out later today. I think uh, Profits Hour start up right about now. I've been teaching since 10. I'm going to go get a sandwich. Dr. P is going to solo until I show. And I will see you all shortly.